Hello and welcome everyone to Developer Update 10.8, where we talk about Update 10.8, also known as the Nerf Repatch, maybe. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into that one a little bit later. So I've got Jean with me here. Thank you so much for joining me. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit what we've got planned today? Hello everyone. Hello Ryan. Uh, um, today, as expected, Nerf to Renfri. <laughs> we'll be discussing those. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we're also bringing some attention to the different scenario archetypes we've been introducing with 10.7. Um, our stance on them is that we do believe they've been kind of overrated. It's also a more complex situation where we also think that with the years, people have actually become better at playing against scenarios, like kind of exploiting their weaknesses. And uh, the influence of Renfrey shouldn't be uh, also understated because we also think that uh, even though Renfri likes tools like uh, you know, Priority Heatwave, she ends up being quite good at exploiting weaknesses that uh, scenario has. So um, some of these archetypes are actually working, like uh, Skellige Pirate is really silly actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we've basically looked at most of them, uh, though we have had conservative level. Yeah, I think it's always a challenge in game design and balancing when you've got one card or one archetype that overshines the others. And obviously we're going to touch on Renfri and um, her power, but at the same time it's difficult to assess the meta that is basically hidden beneath it. Um, so yeah, we'll get into the changes. Let's start with Renfri as the first card, as we said, we're nerfing her. Um, not just the power and provision, as you can see right here, but we'll also talk a little bit about curses and um, the blessings. Uh, but first of all, she loses two points straight away um, and gains a provision, which means that she now costs a little bit more if you want to run her in her deck and also creates less immediate point slam, as people call it, right? Yep. Um, so, Renfri was meant as this alternative to scenario, and well, let's say she ended up completely stealing the show. Um, as Ryan said, uh, we definitely focused on Renfri's tempo on top of the next changes we'll go in with the curses and blessings. Uh, we've also added Doom to Renfri. Mm -hmm. which isn't meant to completely prevent reuse of the cards. Like obviously, there's still options, just verifying it, and other ways the card can actually be copied with Ignoring Doom. But it will make the most uh, straightforward setups more difficult to achieve. All right, on to the curses. As you can see, um, there's four curses that we changed a little bit. Uh, we've got Curse of Pride that removed a card with 10 or less power, which is now only 8 or less power. Uh, Curse of Wrath, also a very strong option, now goes down to 6 damage, which, um, looking at the impact of this curse, um, is a bigger nerf than it might seem because excess damage used to be dealt to adjacent cards, which is now going to be less on both sides. And uh, the Curse of Envy, now the order reads damage all enemy units by 1, instead of the potential upside of damaging units by two if their power was changed. And then finally, Curse of Gluttony got a little bit of a boost, as you can see. The order now reads, boost an allied unit by two, increase this value by target's base power. Yeah, uh, our objective with the curses was kind of evening out some of the options. Uh, we think a big part of the negative sentiment towards Renfrey was also due to the fact that she had access to these, well, quite strong removal options. Uh, which is why we focused on them. Uh, in in the case of Envy, it had like an incredible point sailing that it could achieve most of the time. So this is also we focused on it. And when it comes to gluttony, was very rarely considered uh, outside of some specialized deck. Like I think uh, Vampire Rentry, uh, some actually quite happy to get gluttony. Uh, so, yeah, we've like slightly upped the floor of it, so its point potential is, is a bit more interesting considering the other options. Awesome. And the Blessings have also been uh, nerfed a little bit, especially these four Temperance, which now only sets the power of the lowest unit to 10 instead of 12, so losing two points there. Uh, blessing of Diligence now only damages eight, uh, six points instead of eight. 
Blessing of Patience, uh, the cooldown has been up to 8, uh, more on that in a second. And Blessing of Humility boosts by 4 only at the end of the round instead of 5 if you pass. Yeah, uh, on the Blessing, our, so the initial approach was touching Temperance and Diligence, uh, since they are these instant reward blessings. Mm -hmm. um, we think that it's important to touch them so that using Grand Free a bit more proactively is more encouraged. And it also has the impact of diminishing the value you can get by, you know, reusing Grand Free a lot of time in, in a row. Uh, in the case of patience, uh, at cooldown 7, uh, you could actually easily <laughs> use it multiple <laughs> times, uh, which we want to, well, make a bit harder. Uh, and humility was just like a very straightforward way to gain points. Um, this is basically all of the changes we're introducing for Renfrey in 10.8, but something I feel like is very important to remind everyone about, even though it's true for all of the changes we do, is that uh, these are not necessarily the last changes we'll do to Renfrey. We'll keep looking into the card. Uh, if it keeps overperforming, we'll come back to it. If it completely underperforms following these changes, we'll also consider possible improvements. We'll see. Awesome. Um, yeah, on to the next change. Also a neutral card that got a little bit more spotlight with these Renfrew decks, um, because you usually want to thin your deck mm -hmm. as much as possible, is our good boy, our bestest boy, Nickers. Um, now you have to pay one more provision if you want to run him in your deck. Yeah, to be fair, Nickers was actually already played a bunch uh, before Renfrew, though she definitely has accelerated that. Uh, Let's face it, at, at 7 provision, it was just very easy to include in your deck, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another deck that was very happy about this card was the Golden Necker. Um, uh, more specifically, the Syndicate version of Golden Necker uh, that we've seen on the leaderboard quite a bunch. Um, as such, we don't think the buff that we did in 10.1 is necessary anymore. Like, there is actually cards uh, out there nowadays that do value these softer consistency tools because they don't necessarily have access to better stuff anyway. So, yeah, back to 8. Awesome. And, um, yeah, looking into the future, we've got Skellige up next. We've got two cards that we want to mention right here. Uh, the first one in full full glory, basically, here is Bjorn Stormason. Um he now is one power less and also one armor less, which I'd say is a bigger nerf to the card than maybe just the power because obviously it clashes with an enemy unit, so it's also mm -hmm. one removal less. But as we know, he's a veteran, so he's going to grow in power over the course of the round. And then a little bit of a power adjustment as well for the deranged Corsair at the bottom. You can see now only three power instead of four. Yeah. Um so it's also pointing out that the Endless Voyage, the pirate scenario, has actually had quite decent results, uh, which is why we're not touching it. Uh, but ultimately, the pirates have shown to be incredibly potent uh, by themselves in like Renfrey decks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So even though we are touching Renfrey and we are touching Nickers, we are also we also think that these two pirates have great raw value, which is why we are doing these pretty straightforward nests to them. All right. And for the next faction that we want to take a look at is Syndicate. Uh, first up, the Conjurer's Candle now costs one provision more as well. Um, I think you can agree here that it's just a very flexible tool of spending your coins, right? Yeah, um, well, it was, it's interesting because it's, it was an experiment we've done. Uh, and while, like, when it was designed, some people thought it wouldn't see play and some people thought it would be very good. Well, it turned out to be incredibly good. <laughs> uh, at six provision, the card was basically is basically present in every syndicate dex. Now, um, there is a reason behind this, right? Like uh, spenders is valuables uh, are valuable, and uh, we probably in the future need to keep thinking about uh, introducing good ways that coins can be spent. But mm -hmm. uh, we do also want you to think a bit more uh, about including that card or not. And so it's been uh, valued a bit more, right, at 7 provision. Yep. Um, you also have to think a bit more 
how to get your hoard up because Treasure Huntress now has hoard 9, making it a little bit harder to use those fees. Yeah, uh, the new Treasure Huntress was uh, basically enabled the creation of this new incredibly solid Golden Nether Cadet deck, which um, basically aims at spamming Treasure Huntress infused ability as a way to create a lot of triggers for Tons Folk. Uh, which gave the card a second life, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to kill that deck, but we also want to make it uh, more difficult to just, you know, spam Treasure Huntress uh, in Choose Ability. Uh, increasing the horde allows us to do that. Uh, um, if you don't do extra setup, you're basically going to be restricted to only using it once per turn. And it is going to require a setup, right? Because you do need to be achieving that old nine or more realistically, Old 7 if you're running Hidden Cash. Yeah, I think, uh, was it Natalia modeling for the card? She will be, I think, very understanding of the note. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, moving on to Failed Experiment. Um, also a bit harder to use now if you uh, want to move poisons from it to other units. It now has a cooldown three. Yes, uh, Failed Experiment, kind of similar to Treasure and Trust. It really became a core card to its own specifics package, uh, the poison one in this case. Uh, it was basically just able to generate so much offensive poisons mm -hmm. uh, by clicking it uh, repeatedly, which proved to be incredibly strong, even if you do have to poison it and, and spend three coins to be able to move that poison uh, uh, counter. Um, it, so yeah, by increasing the cooldown, we limit the ability to you know click it a lot. But also, uh, we do encourage players to potentially use the card um, kind of proactively, because uh, if they want to use it repeatedly, well, they have to go through these three turns of cooldown. Mm -hmm. All right. And one final card that we want to take a look at in Syndicate is the Scenario, the new one. It now only costs 14 provision instead of 15. Yeah, uh, while Treasure and Trust did find a lot of success by itself, the old package uh, hasn't really gotten there yet, even though it's, well, it has, you know, this very big potential for current generation, which has been acknowledged by, by players. Um, so for now, we've mo we're moving in with a small change, and uh, we'll look if, like, the interest in the deck increases as a result of that. Uh, also worth considering that with the nerf to treasure and trust, uh, well, running the full old package might become a bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, with you know Renfrey a bit more out of the picture, uh, but well, if necessary, we'll come back to the point. Awesome. So that's it for the syndicate changes so far. Um, next up, we've got a little bit of a let's say bug fix that we want to touch on, but it really concerns one. Um, scratchy cat. <laughs> We've got Sir Scratch a lot that uh, is running rampant right now as well, um, bouncing, jumping everywhere, and usually being played in multiple rounds and not just two, but rather three rounds. So we've got a bug fix that we introduced which yeah. says the replay effect will now properly result in doomed units being banished and purify tokens will no longer be banished when replayed. So why don't you go ahead and explain what this means? Yeah, so it's kind of a fun one, right? Like, instead of uh, actually changing the card itself, we're actually changing, well, actually back, back fixing it, which is going to drastically change the way it can be played. Um, so, the explanation. Previously, uh, a replay effect, so replay effects you can find on Shell Scratch a lot, Chameleon, uh, Charge of Red Riders, as well as Teleportation. Mm -hmm. Uh, what they would do is they would first reset the card and then, only then, you would pick it up from the board to play it. Yeah. Now, uh, this behavior wasn't consistent. Uh, if you use the card like an Ephraim Invocation or even if you picked John Thompson, like a lot of players pointed out, uh, the opposite was actually happening. The card was picked up from the board first and only then it was resetted. Yeah. So. Uh, in the case of Yennefer's Invocation or John Sumson, if the target was doomed, because it was being picked up from the board first, well, it's doomed, it gets banished. Yeah. That's it. I did lose my card advantage once. 
Now, in the case of replay effects, uh, because we were resetting first, it meant the Doom token was removed and then the card was picked up from the board. Mm -hmm. Other issue that would, could be happening, if you had uh, a token or any card that started with Doom, right? Mm -hmm. and then you had purified it. Well, if you play the replay effect on it, well, since it was resetted first, it would gain back Doom and then and get, get banished on the board and then get <laughs> banished and you had no clue what just happened, yeah. right? Um, we have solved this consistency. So now, if your source scratch a lot is doomed, if you click the order, it gets banished. If you use teleportation on a card that has doomed, it gets banished. Mm -hmm. If the card doesn't have doomed, it doesn't get banished. That's it. Very Simple. nice. Um, and yeah, this is probably going to limit a lot uh, the, the potential for abuse of the scratch lot. Yeah, and I know that there's going to be lots of people that are going to play so scratch a lot on day one on patch day and click on it while it's doomed and then it just disappears and they're gonna be like oh what happened yeah. cdpr uh, fix your game but no this is now how we want the game actually to play out and uh, as you said purifying tokens now actually works if you want to replay them so yeah they will now get reset off the board then get back to their original state while being played so they will obviously have doomed once you've played them but you will actually be able to play them <laughs> yep all right you know what i think in turn we've actually got a little bit of a buff though for sir scratch a lot not a big huh. one but it gains the knight category due to a uh, large yes. outcry by the community finally can you imagine all of the interactions you can now do with this <laughs> all of the synergies incredible man all the synergies awesome all right now let's take a look at the second thing that we want to mention in the monster faction which is the manners dark secret yes um a pretty small change actually but we think it can have a pretty important impact uh on prologue the Curse Damsel that you spawn will now immediately get boosted by two, which means mm -hmm. that instead of having four points on the board, you are going to have six. Uh, well, the immediate effect is that obviously it's going to be more tempo, which is actually a pretty big deal for these scenario, which are kind of lacking in the department. Yep. Uh, but the other side effect is that uh, it actually makes triggering the chapter one's passive easier. Because, uh, well, instead of having a four power five units on your board, it's six power by default. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the following cards you play have, well, more chance to be under six power. So yeah. that you can actually get the buff from the chapter one. And I guess on top of that, your access to a removal tool in terms of a buffed cursed damsel will be a bit quicker in the round as well. Mm -hmm. So you, maybe you can answer those engines of your opponent a turn or two earlier than before all right oh, yeah absolutely and now let's take a look at the one thing that we want to highlight in the northern realms faction which is knighthood now it is actually a 10 provision warfare card a gold card um, and it reads play a knight from your deck and boost it by one for each knight you control yeah, um, so the Knight archetype is another one of the scenario archetypes which has been performing well. In fact, it is incredibly stable, I'm quite happy about it. Uh, still, we want to keep experimenting a bit more with it. And so we decided to make Knighthood, which we had not touched in 10.7, into a specialized uh, tutoring option, mm -hmm. which uh, can both be used as a way to, you know, pay off from having a lot of Knights, right? Like, any of the turn at the end of the round, but also as potentially a way to immediately trigger your card uh, grace ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just on top of that, uh, it's a player knight, not just play a bronze knight, so you can, you know, fish for yep. those, I don't know, Prince Anseis that you've missed, which now immediately gets boosted and is a tall removal option. So yeah, lots of potential options to fix your bad draws and just be a bit more consistent. Very nice, very nice. All right, moving on to the enemy, obviously, of Northern Realms, Nilfgaard mm. on the other side of the board. Uh, let's take a quick look at Eternal Eclipse Initiate. Um, it now got changed. John also told me, yeah, this is actually just a straight up buff because it now reads at the end of its infusibility, instead of the power being set to one, so the card that you get on your board if you play Eternal Eclipse and kill the enemy card that had this infused into, normally you would get the card 
uh, at the power one. Now the power is set to the number of cultists on your side. Obviously from the opponent, you know, you know the Gwen text, right? So the opponent <laughs> reads this <laughs> and it says your opponent controls, which means that you, you the player of Eternal Eclipse Initiate, the card that you get is now boosted by the number of cultists on your side, which the card actually counts itself right so you always have at least one cultist on your side meaning it's just a straight up buff yeah the card just got the cultist tag and it counts itself so it's minimum gonna be set to one cannot kill itself very nice very nice uh, on top of that two small provision buffs uh, as well for eternal eclipse deacon now only four provision and the eternal eclipse so the another scenario going down to 14 provision yep um so the cultists like something that players have found out very quickly is that they can reach you know these incredible uh point ceilings right uh but they have in fact been performing very poorly uh probably is like one of the worst scenario archetype <laughs> since 10.7 um and part of it is also because they tend to uh run out of steam after a single turn right like they commit everything a single mm -hmm. turn so uh, we've had a two-fold approach. Uh, in one hand, the modification to Eternal Eclipse Initiate allows us to give more value to the Cultist tag uh, outside of the scenario, right? Like there is a purpose to actually having Cultist on your board, which kind of allows us to raise the floor of the package as a well. whole. Um, and when it comes to the Persian buffs to Decon and Eclipse, this makes the entire package free provis the free provisions cheaper, mm -hmm. which means that it is way more easy to include in the different existing archetypes that Nilgard has available. All right, yeah, I think this is going to be uh, interestingly received because there's, um, you know, with Nilfgaard, there's always this Nilfgaard effect where there's players already that already wrote to me or DM me saying like, what is this Nilfgaard cultist archetype? This is so busted, this is so OP. And then you look at the stats and it's and like, yes. yeah, no, no, not at all, not at all. And then they're gonna see these buffs and go, like, this is outrageous, but they do need a little bit of help. So we're giving it and obviously we're taking close uh, care. So obviously next patch, if they are stronger than expected, mm -hmm. then we can always, you know, judge on that again in the future. As always. All right. And now on to the Scoia'tael. We've got a little bit of uh, a deep dive into multiple archetypes, mm -hmm. let's say. First up, we've got Munro Bruce. Uh, now has a little bit of a changed uh, ability and he loses his one armor. Now his ability reads Zeal Order, transform one ally Drowdy Dwarf into a Dwarf Berserker like he did before, but now he has a cooldown at that cooldown 2 with the additional barricade set cooldown to 1. Also, just before you go ahead and explain this change, uh, Zoltan Warrior Naoni has zero armor instead of one. Yeah, um, so Moon or Breeze, uh, Zoltan Warrior, Dwarven Chariots, these three cards were used as an incredibly mid-range package in a lot of Scarecell decks mm -hmm. as like, you know, just a way to profit. Um, and it wasn't quite our intention with these cards. Uh, as such, we've modified them in such a way that um, they will either require more setup from you or Basically, you should be running Mac and Forge as intended. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for instance, the removal of the armor in Zoltan Warrior is exactly that, right? You lose access to the passive if you don't put armor on Zoltan Warrior. In the case of Moon Rebruist, uh part of its strength was the fact that it was instant tempo, uh, thanks to the, the fact that its effect was charge based. Mm -hmm. So, changing it to cooldown uh, removes that ability. Though it does open up the ceiling of the card if it is unentered. Yeah. Uh, but similarly to Zoltan Warrior, the remove armor means that, well, if you do want to reach these heights, you do need to be putting armor on it. All right. Uh, um, yeah. That's it for them. Pretty straightforward, uh, but also actually quite clever. I like that change. I like that change. As you said, it really benefits you now. If you run Mahakam Forge, you can still be very powerful with your doors, but it's just not something that you can slot into any Squirtel deck. All right. Next up, uh, another 
I guess, archetype that benefits of running at least one dwarf is harmony, right? Uh, so, what is a Brocolon? Now one less provision. Mysteries of Lockvane, same thing right here. Another, actually another one of those scenarios that is now only 14 provision. And then Barnabas Beckenbauer got a little bit of a change. You could also call it a buff. Uh, one less power, but two less provisions, so a lot easier to run in your decks. Yeah, a pretty straightforward buff all across the board. Uh, trying to make the high-end cards of the Harmony deck more affordable, considering the deck hasn't been performing super strongly. Mm -hmm. When it comes to it, like, that's the interesting thing. Uh, cards like Enferian and Chameleon have actually been performing quite well as a stand more, more standalone-ish package uh, in the Renfrey deck. Mm -hmm. But uh, the more scenario-based one is struggling, which is why we're addressing it. Uh, and in the case of Barnabas, uh, we've kind of re-evaluated um, the card, considering that like it does have a pretty hefty setup to yep. get these points. Uh, one more thing is that we have actually went through uh, a lot of skeletal cards, and we have added additional categories to these uh, categories like Bandit, Soldier, Warrior, mm -hmm. Agent. And to, uh, I think, 66. Yeah, actually <laughs> quite cards. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a lot. And um, this affects the Harmony deck uh, in a way, not necessarily because a lot of cards that they run uh, are going to have additional categories, though some of them do, but also because uh, you can find cards like this through Lockfane Convergence and uh, Mysteries of Lockfane Chapter 1 errors about the number of categories yep. you as. All right, very cool. Now on to the poison package of the Harmony cards. We've got Dried Ranger, now actually got changed a little bit. Um, the Basically, it felt bad kind of to have this ping of damage on the card that you are going to poison anyways and going to destroy. So now the poison and the damage have been separated into two different deploy abilities. Uh, first, if you play it in the melee row, it damages an enemy unit by two. If you play it in the range row, it still poisons the enemy unit, but because you kind of lose that one proc of damage if you poison, uh, we gave it a little bit of a, a point boost to four points. Um, yeah, to be completely honest, uh, we wanted to increase its power anyway, and uh, we took <laughs> the opportunity to split apart the effect. Uh, well, the, the point of the original effect, I think the damage and the poison, was that it was offering flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you could apply that poison, and well, if you didn't want it to complete it, or if you couldn't complete it, at least you were getting some points down. Uh, but it was uh, perceived as, you know, being kind of counterproductive, kind of felt bad, mm -hmm. uh, which is why uh, we've split it apart. Uh, and yeah, in general, we've, we've decided to look at like the poison package of the Harmony archetype, since uh, it is an option that they can run. Yeah, I guess before you could also always, as the opponent, you kind of had to play this mind game with the enemy that played Dried Ranger, not knowing do they have another poison or did they just use it for the one ping. And now, if they play it for the poison, maybe you can be more sure, or maybe you just got bamboozled even harder. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I really like that. Uh, another one of those harmony cards that now um, has a little bit of a different ability is actually Weeping Willow. Um, now the melee ability has actually turned into an order, which, as you mentioned earlier to me, means that if you played on deploy in the range row, you can now move it to the melee row and still benefit from its melee ability. Uh, on top of that, the trained hawk ranged ability, moving a unit, actually now is able to play on your own units and not just enemy units. Absolutely. Um, so basically we wanted to give something on melee to Weeping Wheel. Mm -hmm. It felt a bit better considering the setting in which you were playing it. And we were kind of inspired by an existing card, actually, like Forest Whisperer, to make that melee ability uh, an order so that you could technically play it on range and then move it melee if you wanted to benefit from both effects. Uh, and as a result of this, we also figured out that it would feel better if Train Oak would allow you to do that by letting you target not only enemy units, but also allied ones. I think that's pretty cool. I think it's like the 
the the willow and the hawk playing together you know it's mm -hmm. it starts off in the background then the hawk scouts the the, the, the lines <laughs> of combat and then the weeping willow moves onwards into the melee row um yeah very cool very flavorful and uh, i think that's it for scoyatel uh, as we said before we had about 66 cards that gained uh, another, another additional no, you'll uh, see that in the patch note categories um yeah i think you'll see a line that says a lot of cards gained <laughs> categories but we'll check again we'll check all right and now we've got one more thing to cover regarding um how the gameplay is affected so let's move on to a big bug fix uh, or let's say an impactful change in the way that the game plays out which uh, says in situations where multiple cards are on the play stack the card spawned would be getting played first ignoring the current order of the play stack that was the bug please tell me jean how it is now Yes, um, so this bug actually only applied to some specific cards that would spawn cards in the play stack. Even um, better if it's inconsistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fully inconsistent. So basically, the way play stack is supposed to work is um, the cards are resolved in the order they are put in the play stack. The first card to be put in the play stack it should be the first card to be at or mm -hmm. uh, be resolved. Yes. Now, some cards, <laughs> uh, in particular the scenarios and the location, would actually hijack that priority and um, the card that they would spawn instead of you know take waiting for their turn would hijack the first spot and be resolved first uh, a good example was if you were playing Hermion with in shadow um, well intuitively you could have expected that the card that would be too tall from Hermion should be played first and then only the card spawned from Ganyan of Shadow reacting to Armion uh, would be played. But what was in fact happening is that Ganyan of Shadow was hijacking this and you would first play the card from Ganyan of Shadow and only then the card from Armion. Well, we've corrected this. It will now be consistent, always the same order. Uh, the reason we wanted to discuss it, this here is because uh, we are aware that, uh, you know, because of the way it didn't, it, because of the way it works, players had to get used to this weird behavior. Mm -hmm. And that is going to necessarily change their habits. And it is something we apologize for. At the same time, we do think that uh, changing, like fixing these inconsistencies in general will make this card more intuitive to grasp and easier to deal with. Yeah, I must say, I'm very glad that you're on the team and you're with us and you're scouring and digging through these inconsistencies and making it a let's say more straightforward not just me. no not just you but you know but you know the whole gameplay team making sure that the uh, inconsistencies of the, the the game the way the game plays out is actually consistent and how the player would expect it if they start yeah. learning the game i think that's very valuable so thank you there's for that. still a lot left but one at a time one we're not at done time. we're oh. not done exactly <laughs> all right i think that's it for the balance changes um let's take a quick look at some upcoming stuff that is also in the patch like for example we've got more returning journeys mm -hmm. uh, specifically we've got the mage package uh, let's say let's say the sorceresses are coming back um, we've got Alzua, Triss <clears throat> and Yennefer of course uh, and they're all coming back with the patch tomorrow so you can get those and even if you already have them uh, in your collection, you now will be able to gain new cosmetics on top of the existing ones. So there's going to be some new musical music trinkets, uh, card backs, and auras. So yeah, well, I'll leave it to the players to figure out what exactly has been added and what they can get on top of the existing journey. But yeah, everyone can look forward to that. Um, and additionally, we've got a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of a spoiler, because uh, obviously the whole company, CDPR, is uh, celebrating their 20th anniversary right now. So yeah, happy birthday. Uh, and Gwent is going to be part of that, which means that we're going to have a in-game event, an in-game event that uh, celebrates the 20th anniversary by giving you all the opportunity to get new cosmetics in the game for free just by playing the game. Uh, I'm talking about car packs, avatars, border, so lots of nice stuff in themes of our celebration. Uh, and on top of that, at the end, no, tomorrow, tom tomorrow is Tuesday, patch day, 
Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're gonna have a celebratory Gwen stream as well on the CDPR channel. So actually, it's gonna be Vlad and me sitting down. I think Jean, you're gonna be the uh, the game player in the background. Oh. So everyone oh. now knows that if there's gonna be misplays on Wednesday, oh, it's God. on Jean. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, we're gonna be talking about the history of Gwent um, and qu answering questions as well from the chat. So make sure to be there because you will also be getting a free Rarock avatar for Gwent just by tuning in. How easy is that? Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. All the things that we wanted to mention and cover. This is a bit of a more concise dev video compared to maybe the pre-final segment from last time, but I think we covered all that uh, was important uh, to cover in this video. Always uh, make sure to read the, the patch notes for the whole full list of changes. And uh, thank you very much, Jean, for taking the time and joining me today. Always a pleasure, always happy to be here. Thank you, Ryan. All right, that means uh, goodbye from us and see you in the next one. Bye. See you, everyone. <laughs>